All right, anyway, so today we're going to be starting with uh, different theories of uh, psychology. How do we get to the point uh, where we actually are today? Uh, the things that we know about, we've learned in first lecture about PET scan and brain scan and MRI. We read about that. Uh, we also studied about um, how our, our mind makes shapes. Um, for example, we uh, made a circle like this, and then we erased some parts of that. But even though these parts are missing, your brain can make a pattern that it's a circle. And we also studied about different three-dimensional shapes that our brain actually makes out the bigger picture of things, uh, even though there are details missing from that. And that's something that we have the capability of doing in our brains. Um, that's also known as Gestalt therapy or Gestalt psychology. That's one field of psychology that we are going to be studying uh, today. Um, the purpose of today's lecture is to actually tell you how did we reach this point that we know so many things. So there are different psycho psychological schools um, that people have invented um, so that we learn from every school a specific lesson and then we take you the new one and then we come to the final point where we actually know everything. Uh, so one of the first theories that we uh, know about psychology and that was also the first lab. Um, that was made in Germany by um, Wilhelm Bund. He was a German um, psychologist. So he made a very simple lab uh, in which he would just bring people and he would ask them simple questions about structure of things. How does our mind make the reality of what uh, different things are made of? And what is exactly uh, the facts about a certain object or certain person or certain idea? Uh, so for example, if I have an object in my hand, I mean, how do you perceive that? I mean, that was the beginning of psychology. You gotta remember it's in 19th century. So it's very, very early. So people don't have these kind of equipment um, or necessary research methodology to find out the reality. So they were just thinking in the beginning how to find out how people think. So what they do is that they give them um, certain objects and then uh, think about this object. What do you see? Yes, but you know now that it's called marker, but what is, I mean, what does it look like? I mean, what, what's the shape? What's the color? It's like a stick, okay? Vertical shape. Vertical shape, what else? I mean, even though you have not touched it, but you know that it's plastic, but what else? Black and white. Black and white colors. So if we divide your observation into different categories, um, you have noticed the shape, you have noticed the size, it's um, cylindrical or it's vertical. Um, and also the colors that it has. And this is exactly how we perceive um, things when we see them. And the purpose of structuralism is to find out how human beings find reality. So what they did is that uh, they gave them different objects and asked them their feelings about the object, uh, what they actually see, uh, how they perceive colors and things like that. And based on those experiments, um, they found out that human beings have a certain pattern of organizing things in their brains or explaining things uh, that follows a certain process. So human beings give structure to everything. So if you use the same example to the circle one, what do you see in the circle? Exactly, you see the circle, but that's not a complete circle. So why do you say circle? Incomplete circle. Arcs and circles or an incomplete circle. And what color is that? And what's in between that's not filled? Exactly. So your mind is also making structure of things. You know, it's a circle even though it's not complete, but you know that you know if there were some lines there, that would be a complete circle. You also notice that it's black line and then white empty spaces. You also know that it's quite large. Um, it's also on the whiteboard and it's not something like, I mean if that was a football instead of the circle, then that would be an object. But right now it's just two dimensional drawing on the whiteboard and your mind perceives it as the, as the distinct thing from a football. And that's how the structuralism came into being. So they did very simple experiments, even though that was very simple, and it was not able to explain every minute detail of psychological conceptualization of um, objects. It was one of the first steps towards understanding psychology and objects around us. Now, as I said, structuralism is very basic. It cannot explain other things. For example, what does this circle actually mean? I mean, what is its util utility in real life? Exactly. But the problem is what thing could that be? Can structuralism explain um, how useful a circle is 
in real life. For example, many people know that, uh, some people say that um, the word is round or football is round like a circle. Um, you can all, balloons are round, it's in the shape of circle. Balls are round in the shape of circle. There are so many things that you can deduce from the circle also. But structuralism alone cannot explain all the different subtleties of the circle. So we need something else to explain that. And that's where the functionalism comes. So functionalism actually um, studies how we perceive those objects and ideas and images and expand the definition to real life things. For example, what is your uh, uh, religious point of view um, that relates to the circle? For example, let's explain. No, but moon has nothing to do with religion. But the fact is that you know you think you can probably think of life as a circle. So you know you you're a child, you cannot walk, uh, but then you um, get, you're you're getting nutrition from your uh, surrounding, and then you grow up and you're able to walk, and then you become young, and then become you, you become strong, um, and then you go out um, do things in life, and with time you have your own children, and then you become old, and then you die. So you can also think of it as a circle. Um, what do you mean? Sir, I mean, uh, sir, after death, you can uh, like So how do it can be? Uh, yeah, but you can think of it also as a life circle. So it starts and it ends. So, you know, there was nothing and you were born. So there was nothing and you were born and then it started again and then you came back to nothing. Yes, sir. So you, your existence does not exist anymore. Yes. Uh, and this is, I mean, the meanings that you're attributing to the circle. And remember, there's nothing but black and white space here. But all the meanings that you're giving the circle, that is the ultimate goal of uh, explaining um, the uh, ultimate function of uh, the theory functional psychology. Uh, it finds out the real function or utility of anything in real life. Um, it enables you to think deeply uh, on a far more intricate level than structuralism. Structuralism only tells you the reality of the object. How do you perceive that? But you cannot go into deeper meanings of you know, this object without using functionalism, without finding out the real life utility of that. Now also, even functionalism at some point it stops. And, um, if you find out the meaning of you know, the religious uh, symbol of circle and then you can give it a shape of a child's birth, is becoming young, getting married, having own children, um, your parents die, eventually you die and that's the closure of the circle. And that's one way of looking at things. But then what is the whole purpose of functionalism itself? What is the whole purpose of the circle? Why do we exist? I mean, what, what, what was the reason to becoming born in the first place? Even though it's not in our own hands. I mean, you get your life without your choice and you die without your choice. So there is not much choice. But what is the whole bigger picture of the whole thing? I mean, you can start question from right now. I mean, look at the people sitting around you. Why do they exist? There's so many other people who are sitting at home. Why are they not sitting with you and these other absolutely strange people um, that you didn't know like um, two semesters ago um, or you haven't seen before? All of a sudden you get to know each other and you exist. And is it all without a plan? Or there was no scheme in that? And is there a utility in that or not? So the bigger meaning of things that requires even deeper thinking of making sense of things. Why is that? The things are happening, the things are happening. So what we do is that, you know, psychologists thought about that for a long time. And there are different schools of psychology that attempts to explain this reason that why are you existing here? Why are you sitting here? So one of the theories is, uh, that's pretty controversial in many contexts. Uh, one of the theory is uh, radical behavioralism. So in 19th century, early 19th century, it was very popular to use animals as the basic uh, entity in explaining human behavior. So people who are, do not have religious beliefs, um, most people in the West, they have at some point left religion behind and they have become atheists and they believe in the fact that there is no God and the only reason that they could actually use to explain their existence and society around them is based on science. Um, and in attempt of doing that, they think that human beings and animals are the same. The human beings are just animals, but a little bit more smarter. 
And if you use this um, theory, then you only have one main means of explaining human behavior. And what is the commonality between two animals? Um, two animals, I mean one hu being human, another being um, the mammals or reptiles or other places. So, what they found out is that there are certain um, needs that animals have. For example, uh, for existence, um, they need food and security and shelter and clothes um, or fire or water, these things. And that is exactly the same thing we need. I mean, for example, if you are left out for water for many, many days, you are likely going to die. It is the same thing with the food. Uh, in winters, it is the same thing with fire. And even without fire, you cannot cook your food, you cannot eat. So, without fire you are going to die in the summers also. And these are the same things that animals use. Do you think lions and rats and squirrels and cats, they can survive without food? Exactly. And if they cannot do that, and if they cannot do that, human beings cannot do that um, at the same level. So, what they do, do is that they use the same logics that just because we have same needs, we are probably same people also. And using that, they used other um, aspects of animal life to human life also. For example, uh, if you can modify the way that you feed animals, you can modify their behavior also. For example, uh, if there is a dog, uh, and I don't know, you can try that at your home also in the neighborhood. If you give dog food like meat or bones uh, every day, it is going to become very good friend of you. It is not going to bite you and he's not going to uh, bite your uh, friends or your children or your parents. Because dogs are generally very loyal people. Uh, I mean if you call them people. So, what they do is uh, they basically become very good friends just because you are feeding them. And so, this idea that if you give other people food, you take care of them, they are going to take care of you. And what they thought is that that is the exact same principle that you can use on human beings. So, if you can give them food, for example, uh, one way of doing that is that if you come to class uh, regularly, you are studying, um, you are going back doing your homework, you understand the concept, if you do not understand you ask questions um, and you appear in exams and then your exams are good and the same thing happens with finals, you get a very good GPA. But imagine if you study so hard, you work so hard and then you fail the course even though when you do that. And people who do not come to class, who do not study, do not submit assignments, they get a 4 GPA. How would that be? I mean in many ways it is very unfair I mean, because we know have we have the structure in our mind that you know if you do the right thing you are going to get rewarded for that and if you do the wrong thing you are going to be punished for that. But if you you know you switch the positions I mean what are you actually doing? You are doing the wrong reinforcement. I mean this is why you have seen the children um, in small classes when they do their homework or when they learn ABC when they learn counting from 1 to 100, you give them toffees and candies and chocolates and you know you give stars or cheeks and things like this depending on which school you go. Uh, why do we do that? Because they are the children, they have food at home also, why do they need sweets? <coughs> it is because you are encouraging them that they have done something good and that is why they should be acknowledged for that. And when you do that, you are basically using a principle uh, in behavioralism that is called um, reinforcement. Now, there are two kinds of reinforcement. One is the positive reinforcement which is um, giving someone reward and the other thing is the negative which is the punishment. So, if something someone does wrong, uh, you know he commits a mistake, um, he does not attempt paper incorrectly, he is deducted the marks or he is you know, thrown out of the class or he is punished. For example, when you are late sometimes, um, in school you are not even allowed to take the class or you are marked absent and your parents are being called. And then there are some repercussions of the uh, wrong things that you have done. Uh, now, why do we do that? So, one is the positive reinforcement, other is the negative punishment. And that is the exact same principle that they have tried to do uh, with animals. So, there was a brilliant scientist called uh, Watson. Uh, so, what he did was that he took a cage and he put a rat in that just to find out if the experiment actually works. So, there are two buttons uh, in the rat cage. And when rat presses one button, uh, there is food coming out of the cage. Uh, so, as soon as you press the button, there is a food pellet coming in. And the other button, uh, if the rat presses that button, you know, it gets a mild electric shock. And it is it's, it's not very painful, but you know, it still hurt, it hurts a little bit. 
So very soon they, they found out that the rats learn which button is the best to press press. So what they start doing is they keep pressing the pellets and then keep the food come, keeps coming out. But then the, he does not uh, press the button that gives them electric shock. And this is why animals um, are very smart when it comes to punishment and reward. And that's the exact same principle that uh, applies to human beings also. For example, if you are offered two jobs, so one of the job is that you're working from 9 in the morning to 9 in the evening and your salary is 15,000. And there's another job that you're working from 10 in the morning to 2 in the uh, afternoon and then you're offered you're offer a 30,000 salary. Which ones you're going to choose? And why is that? Exactly, that's less work and then you get more money. And that's the exact same principle that animals have also. They are very smart about what option is going to yield them the best results. And that's the exact option that we use in determining our salaries, um, our reward system, promotions, uh, bonuses and things like this. Is. I don't know if anyone has ever worked as a salesman, but if you work in a sales company, what you do is that the more you sell, uh, the more you get the bonus out of that. And this is why s some bigger companies like Moblink and Newphone and um, other target based companies, if you achieve your target, they send you to international trips like Malaysia or Indonesia or other places like that. So why is that? Because I mean other people do the same thing. But because they are earning enough for the company to be able to afford their trips to do that. So they are basically positively reinforcing them. Now there is another uh, way that you can uh, control animal behavior and also human behavior. And that's called classical conditioning. And the first one was called operant conditioning. So you had two operations. One was uh, punishment and one was reward. The other is the classical conditioning. In classical conditioning what happened is that um, they brought a dog and most dogs eat actually meat. So as soon as they bring the meat, then they start salivating. So you know, their saliva comes out of their mouth. And by the way, that's the exact same uh, principle with human beings also. Now for a moment, think about biryani or korma or pizza, anything like that. You see, it's almost halfway there. So you know, human beings start salivating also. And sometimes it happens in dreams also. You're thinking about food. And <laughs> so what happens is that, you know, as soon as you start salivating, um, you know that the food is coming. But there's one more thing that you can do. Uh, so if you have a bell, so what they did is that as soon as they brought the meat. Anyway, back to the point that you know, um, human beings start salivating also as, as, they, as soon as they think about um, the meat or the food because that's natural instinct. So what they did is that actually just before bringing the meat, so they rang a bell. So they brought an external stimulus to rang a bell. So what they did is that every time they give food to dog, uh, they will ring a bell and then they give the food to the dog. And because at some point, dog associates the ring with the food. So as soon as the bell starts ringing, he knows that food is coming so and then he starts celebrating. So no, 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 that's uh, Ivan Pavlov. That's a different scientist. I mean, I don't know. Uh, you can read that here also. Um, and that's in, uh, I'm going to show you a video also. As soon as the light comes, there's the video I can show you. So what happens is that as soon as you start ringing the bell, the dog starts salivating. And at some point, dog has associated the bell so strongly with the food that even if there is no food, they only ring the bell and then the saliva starts coming out. Because now your brain is used to the fact that you know, when the bell rings, you will have the food. And that's exactly how human beings make associations with things also. For example, why is that, that um, every uh, first uh, of Every first day of new month, people start thinking, oh, now today I'm going to get salary. It's always like this. Or you know, if you have a fixed date for your pocket money, you don't know, today I'm going to get a pocket money. And then, and then you already have planned, you know, I'm going to buy, you know, new phone, or you're going to buy new shoes, or you know, probably get some uh, nice food and things like that. So you can have a lot of plans. Um, and that's exactly what motivates you uh, in the fact that, you know, you know, you associate a specific date with money which in turn is going to buy you things that you want to buy. And that's called um, classical conditioning. Um, so in this conditioning, um, what they do is that they found out that animal experiments can actually be applied to human beings. But the only problem with this theory is that they think that human beings are exactly the same thing as animals, which is not true. Human beings have higher order thinking. Uh, 
they get bored of things. Um, they want new, uh, better, faster, um, unique lo looking things. So why is that? that uh, have you ever noticed that uh, if, if you go to zoo, you see different animals like elephants and lions um, and water dogs. Uh, so what happened is that they don't ask uh, the zookeepers that today I'm not going to eat meat or grass, today I want to have sushi or karai or kebab and things like this. Why is that? I mean, they're always happy when you, know, you give them the same food. You know, you bring a lot of meat and throw it in the lion's cage. And it's never going to complain that I don't want to eat meat. They're going to love to have meat. But human beings, they cannot have same food also. I mean, it's always a problem at home also. You say, oh, it's the third time I'm eating dal this week. I'm not eating that. <laughs> you, know, you can always have this complaint at home. But why is that? I mean, if you think deeper into that, why does human being, you know, undervalue things or they do not uh, want to have same thing over and over and over? Because that's something different with human beings that make them get bored with existing things. They do not appreciate the food. You know, they want something better. So if you was, first day if you want to have a dal in a specific way, you want to you know, make it the other way the other day. Um, and third day you want to have a completely different dal, even if that's the only option. So that's the only problem with behaviorism. You know, it does not explain the human spirit. It does not explain the human higher order thinking and complex needs. And the uh, problem of getting bored and used to things. Um, so how we fix those things is that uh, there's something that we